Hi everybody, it's Dr. Lori. How are you doing today? Well, I'm here with your questions and my answers. I've got my bowl and let's start it up. Let's see where we are here. Okay. Can knockoffs become valuable over time, Dr. Lori? For instance, if I have a bronze statue from the 19th century or the 1800s that's a copy of an ancient bronze statue, will that bronze statue ever be worth money? Okay, so can knockoffs be worth money? Well, they won't be worth as much as the original, of course, but yes, knockoffs can be worth money, and they can increase in value over time. They can also decrease in value over time. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Lurie, wait, I know, I know. People say that, well, wait a minute, I, let me understand this. So, you have a knockoff. You have something like, think of a Hummel figurine, right? So you've got a Hummel figurine, and it's from Germany, and it's made in the 1940s, and it's made by the Goebel Company, and that Hummel figurine is worth $150. And then you, there's another figurine that looks like the Hummel, right? It's not really a Hummel. It's a knockoff from Japan made by the Napco Company, right? And it looks a lot like it. Which one's more valuable? That one's worth $40, let's say. Okay, so now, will the Napco knockoff of the Hummel figurine ever go up in value? Well, yeah, it will. It will go up in value the same way that the Hummel figurine will go up in value, okay? So, the Hummel figurine at 150 will go up, right? And then, of course, the Napco piece will go up. But it won't go up as much, right? The other thing that's interesting about this, if you're a true collector, is that the knockoffs mean something to the collectors who collect the Hummels, right? Or you have the original, you know, Venus de Milo sculpture, right, from the ancient world, right? And then you have all the knockoffs from the 1800s of the Venus de Milo sculpture, right? Well, they're not worth as much as the original, but they still do have a value, right? It also speaks to what's important, and this becomes really important in art history and in collecting in general. Why is the Venus de Milo reproduced? Why are the Hummel figurines reproduced? Why is somebody knocking them off? Well, they're knocking them off about one thing and one thing only, the almighty dollar, right? Money is why they're knocking them off. Oh, Hummel's making a lot of money on those little kid figurines. We can make those too and we can do it cheaper. That's basically what they're after. So yes, it can be. Am I telling you to add, I'm not going to advocate that you should be collecting knockoffs, but in fact, there's a whole collecting category of people who say, well, this is interesting to the original, right? So collecting the knockoffs is a thing. And some people do actually um, collect them. And yes, their value can, of course, increase over time. When it comes to increase in value, I want you to think about quality first. Okay, because usually a knockoff is not of the same quality, right? So if you look at those two figurines that look like the little Hummel kids, you know the little Hummel kids, you know what they look like. I want you to think about those particular types of pieces. When you look at one and scrutinize the painting and the glaze work and the ceramic of one, and then you look at the other one, you're going to see that one is of higher quality than the other. And that's usually where the knockoffs sort of fall, off, fall out of favor or fall off. Okay, thanks. Good question. Interesting different. I want to display a framed print in my bathroom. How can I do this without ruining the print? You can't. You can't do this without ruining the print. If you take a shower in the bathroom, wash your hands in the bathroom, go to the bathroom, you know, go to the toilet in the bathroom, and you want to have a print there, if you're using any of that moisture over time, that print will get ruined in the bathroom. Oh, but Dr. Lori, it's in a frame. Oh, it's matted. It's framed. It's UV protective glass. It's all that nonsense. Guess what? It's moisture. Moisture is bad for paper. It'll attract bugs. It'll deteriorate the piece, and you won't have it. So you will ruin it. I'm, I'm not big on this for the bathroom. I always say, you know, art and antiques like to live where you like to live, and they like like to live in temperature and humidity that is about 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. They like temperature that's like humidity that's like 55% relative humidity, right? And remember that they don't like to be in a kitchen where it's hot, where it's cooking, right? You, they don't like to be in direct sunlight right in front of a window. They don't like to be near a vent, whether it's air conditioning or a return. They don't like to be near there either. They don't like foyers. So I would not suggest that you put a print in a foyer. The door opens, the door closes. It's winter, it's summer, it's hot, it's cold. Not a good place for art and antiques. Um, also, of course, attics are damp and sometimes hot and sometimes cold. Basements are damp and sometimes hot and sometimes cold. None of these places are good places for your art and antiques. So the bathroom is probably the worst. 
It reminds me of the story when I was very, very young, one of my first jobs as a private curator for a very, very lucrative, wealthy collector. And they had all different types of pieces. They had all different types of pieces, beautiful pieces from, you know, uh, Dale Chihuly's to wonderful abstract expressionist examples, Thomas Hart Benton, gorgeous pieces. And they had a Georgia O'Keeffe, one of the famous Georgia O'Keeffe paintings of Lake George. And it was hanging over the washing machine and the dryer. So if they could afford to have George O'Keefe over the washing machine and the dryer in the laundry room. Imagine what was in their living room. And that was the worst place for this $3 million painting. So, you know, please, if you're thinking about where you're going to put your pieces, living room is always good. Bedrooms are good. Dens, guest rooms, office. Okay. But anywhere where you're going to have direct sunlight, the foyer is not good. The kitchen is not good. You know, those tandem rooms you want to be aware of. But anyway, thanks for your good question. What's next? Now, you want to hear about the bowl? Let's talk about the bowl. The bowl is a piece of Glidden American pottery made in Alfred, New York. It's designed by a very well-known and famous desire, uh, designer of the 1950s. Fong Chow designed this, the scroll pattern here, sometimes called the swirls. Very, very common and popular for this particular design. It's a large bowl in the 50s. One of the most famous collectors of Glidden American pottery was Lucille Ball. I love Lucy. She collected Glidden. And Glidden, of course, is wonderful ceramic, handmade, hand designed in that terrific mid century modern style. Value on this bowl, just about $125. It's really a winner. So that's today's bowl for our question and answer um, episode. And let's get to another question. Uh, should I buy UV protective glass for my framed prints? Is it worth it? Well, I'll let you decide this one. When I was working in museums, we didn't use UV protective glass because, and I was working in some of the world-class museums in the, in the world. You know, I've lectured at the Louvre and the Hermitage and the Uffizi in Florence and places like that. Worked at the Yale University Art Gallery and, and other museums. And let me just say this, we did not use it. It probably was a budgetary issue in museums for us. We didn't use it. The reason about UV protective glass is it can be protective, it can be helpful, and your professional framer can always talk about this, but in fact, if you properly display a piece, you can use regular glass. So what does that mean? I shouldn't use UV protective glass? Well, UV protective glass will keep out the UV rays the way suntan lotion will keep out the UV rays on your skin, but you have to keep applying the suntan lotion. So the UV protective glass can deteriorate over time, right? But regular glass, it doesn't have to be non-glare, it doesn't have to have any of these fancy schmancy things. A regular piece of glass over a professionally framed print with a mat board that's acid free and a back board that's acid free and spacers or the mat, then the glass. If you don't put that in direct sunlight, that regular piece of glass is gonna be just fine. Now, some people will argue, no, I like the UV protective, no, I like the non-glare. That's fine, that's up to you. But basically what I want you to think about, I want you to think about these particular pieces, right? These particular types of materials for framing as being part of your work of art. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's part of the value of your piece. The frame is part of the value, the mat is part of the value, what you select with respect to glass is part of the value. It all impacts the overall value of your work. So you have a Salvador Dali, right? And you have, you know, I don't know, Dante's Inferno or something by Salvador Dali. And you say, well, I want to put this with non-glare glass. You are adding value or taking away value depending on what you choose, right? This is why professional framing is so important. And I'll talk about identifying valuable frames when you're shopping and also protecting your valuable frames in your own collection when you're buying in another video. Okay. Dr. Lori, I was wondering, particularly when pieces are older and I assume have a higher chance of containing toxic metals like lead, does this affect the value at all? Does it deter buyers? What are the long-term health risks? Okay, let's talk a little bit about this. You know, I, I oftentimes talk about can grandma's china be toxic, right? So do you have lead china, right? Actually, just recently I was talking to my sister and I was talking with her about her china and she said, oh, I've had this china since I got married and this piece of china is all chipped on the side, but you know, we use it once in a while. And I said, throw it away. 
So what do you mean throw it away? I said, throw it away today, right now, throw it away, replace that piece. You can get another replacement. You know how to shop on all the different online places, replacements in Ruby Lane and Etsy and eBay and this place and that place and every place where Tios and whatever it might be, where you're, you can buy these pieces. I want you to go and replace that particular dinner dish, right? Not unlike this dish that's right here. There's a big chip. I said, you know, you shouldn't do that. Why? Well, while her pieces did not contain lead, some of the old pieces can, in fact, and did contain lead. And other, m other basic, uh, you know, materials, uh, elements that can be harmful, cadmium, whatever it might be. So when you have a chip or a crack like that, you know, now what you've done is you've exposed what's inside. So what you want to do is if you have it really severely chipped or cracked, I want you to take it out of commission. So while you want it in your display cabinet, it's not going to hurt anybody, but take it out of commission if you're serving on these pieces. These happen to be my sister's everyday pieces. So she was very surprised that I would say, you know, get rid of it. Some things you have to really protect yourself. So does this deter buyers? A lot of buyers it does not deter. Okay, when you actually have this situation where you don't have a perfect dish. And a lot of people like it and they say, hey, it looks old. Like, it looks antique, you know? Like, oh, it looks antique because it, of course, has this chip or this bump. Or I oftentimes joke, you know, hey, if you were 150 years old, you'd look like this too. You know, you have a couple scrapes and scratches or this big new line that I've got in the middle of my face. Do you have this line? I have this line. I have that spot, which is my mother's age spot, which my mother had too. I got this line, I got these two. I don't look too closely in the mirror anymore, let me tell you. I'm just like, okay, let's just keep the mirror over there. Anyway, so, but when it comes to these pieces, it will deter buyers if they even are knowledgeable about it. So again, I always think it's a good idea and a good practice to show pictures of the condition if you're trying to sell something right? And if you have your own pieces and they're really severely damaged, you got to take those out of commission. Maybe you put them in a box so you keep the whole set, but you've got to get it out of commission. And what I mean by that is you can't put it in serve on that particular piece, even if it's just, you know, you and your husband or you and your partner or whatever it might be eating off of it. Don't eat off of it if there's a big chip out of it. You don't want anything to happen. Some of the old sets, some of the old pieces had lead in it and it was very well known. So some of the old pieces like Fiesta, for example, comes to mind because they were using lead in, large, in, uh, in, large, in a large way in that particular time period. So be aware of that. Just be aware of what you have and make sure that you are keeping your antique china in the best condition you can possibly. One of the ways to do that, don't stack your china more than six high, right? And also make sure if you're putting it on a one of those rails, you know, you've got a big china cabinet and then you've got the rails and you basically will have the dishes like this. Every three times a year, four times a year, give it a one quarter turn. So you don't have all the weight of that dish always on the exact same area of the dish. So I don't know if I made that clear, so I'm gonna make that clear because sometimes I'm clear and I think I'm clear and sometimes I'm not. They go, Dr. Lurie, I don't know what you mean. So I want you to know what I mean. So. Say you have a china cabinet and you've got your pieces on display, right? So you've got this piece and this is your plate, right? So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to look at the mark and make sure the mark is upright. So you can read the mark just like this. So I'm reading it right now from the back. I'm the display cabinet. I'm the back of the cabinet. There's a little indentation that runs the whole cabinet, right? I want you to put that dish in there. That's January when you put the dish in. In March, I want you to move the dish one quarter turn. Three months later, April, May, June, in June, I want you to do it this way. Now the mark is upside down six months later, right? Three months after that, in, in September, one more turn, right? And then by December, you're back to the beginning again. This will give you even distribution as you display your pieces. All this, I know you're going, hey, Dr. Lori, who the heck has time to be turning plates? I know, we're all very busy. But you want to maintain these pieces. You want to hand them down to your little kids. You want to hand them down from grandma all the way down to your great grandkids. Hey, you're going to have to take care of them. And these are some of the tips that you can use. Okay, anyway, back to pick questions. Take off my gloves. Let's see what we got here. Hi, Dr. Lori. Do you appraise motorboat motors? I mean, antique ones. No, I don't appraise motorboat motors. No. You need a specialty person who appraises motorboat motors, right? Even if they're antique ones. I am praise art, antiques, and collectibles, right? So there are some specialties, right? But basically, no. When it comes to motorboat motors, even antique ones, I don't. But thanks for the question. 
Never hurts to ask. You never know. Okay. What else do we have? Hi, Dr. Lori. I love your videos. Thank you. I love that you're watching. I appreciate that you're watching. You got to spread the word. How do you know real coral from fake coral? Real coral has a smooth surface and it is free of any kind of speckles or flecks. Real coral, smooth surface, right? It has that coral color, that nice orangey coral color. It's like an orange yellow color. It's free of specks or any kind of flecks, right? Or any kind of surface element. So that's what you're looking for. Coral's nice. You know, coral, in fact, when I was first at the Yale Art Gallery, I was doing, they used to, they would train us, of course, on what's in the collection. And as you probably know, in places like Yale and Harvard and these great academic uh, museum collections, they have great encyclopedic collections. So they can teach you all kinds of things as their students are coming through. So everything from, you know, the portrait of George Washington at Princeton or uh, the studies for the Declaration of Independence or um, by John Trumbull, um, who was from New Haven, or um, let me think, what else is there? Of course, the George O'Keeffe's are there, and the great Jackson Pollock's Autumn Rhythm, and oh, all different pieces. But anyway, there was a piece, um, a lovely piece of a Thomas Aikens with a woman who was wearing a big coral necklace that happened to be at Yale at that time. And the coral necklace was um, indicative of the fact that this woman who happened to be the artist's fiance that she was ill. So coral, if you see coral or if you have a piece of coral handed down in your family history, maybe a coral pin or a coral earrings or a coral baby teething ring indicated that 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 person was possibly ill and illness because coral was seen as having medicinal properties because it came from the sea. So people would actually have coral in their jewelry. They would have coral as necklaces and different things. So that painting always reminds me of that because I learned about that aspect of jewelry through that particular realistic painting from the 19th century by, of course, the master Thomas Aikens. Okay, one more, let's see where we are. Oh, this one's long, are you ready? Okay, I'm gonna read some of it and I'm gonna paraphrase. Hi, Dr. Lori. My mom's a big fan. Well, good. I love your mom. She's a smart woman. You should listen to her. <laughs> okay. She plans to contact you regarding a family heirloom that I want to try to keep her from selling. Okay. So now this starts to taper. Okay. It's a letter from a famous person who's in our family tree. It's been passed down for some years. And now that it's getting close to being my turn to have this little piece of history, my mom wants to sell it. And I don't understand why. I don't think she needs the money. Do you think that's something she should keep? Um, if she does call you wanting to sell something like that, could you please deter her? Okay, so this, this talks to a couple of things. First of all, I'm not deterring anybody from doing anything. I'll offer my advice. I'll tell you what I think. I'll explain to you how the markets work, but it's her decision, it's her object. I think that's only fair. What this also speaks to is how younger people in a younger generation want antiques. And a lot of you don't think that's true. And there's a lot of people out there who are trying to tell you, oh no, the millennials don't care about antiques. Oh, your kids don't want anything. The people who are telling you that are the people who want to get it from you more cheaply. So they do want it. They say they want it. This woman is writing to me saying, please, please don't let my mom sell it, right? They want it. And they should want it, and you should impress upon them, if you're the parent in this picture or the grandparent in this picture, if that piece is important to you. You know, there were a couple of things. My mother had an, an elephant collection our whole upbringing, and all she said was, keep my elephants. She loved her elephants. So, you know, my sisters and I all keep an elephant. You know, my nieces, because I don't have kids, all keep an elephant. My nephews keep an elephant. So... It's an important thing, and I think what's interesting about it is people keep saying, no, 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 the kids don't want anything. The kids may not want your stuff right when you ask them, and the kids may not want your stuff when you're, you know, busy saying, I'm going to clean out this whole attic, you know. The kids may not want your stuff then, but there will be a time, because I've seen it for years and years with talking to clients, audience members, on TV, on media, you know, all over where people will say, well, I didn't want it then, but I really wish I had it now. Or I didn't want it then, but now that I have children, I wish I could have handed that down to my kids. Or I really always wanted it, but my mom wanted to give it to my sister and my sister sold it, this kind of stuff. So they do want it, don't think they don't want it. And you really have to ask, for this conversation here with these two people, they need to have a family conversation. They need to sit down at a table, you know, and I always say this about everything, 
when you're getting ready to liquidate, when you're getting ready to downsize, if you're divorcing, if you're moving, whatever you're doing, if you're adopting a new kid, if you're moving to a new house, whatever you're doing, any time where you're going to have to deal with the issue of your personal property, art, antiques, and collectibles, sit at the kitchen table where you made all of those big decisions in your life and have a conversation. These people need to have a conversation. Mom, I don't want you to sell this particular piece of our family history. I really want it. And figure out how you can come to a situation where you can both be happy with keeping it, possibly. Or you can both be happy with selling it, possibly. But you really have to have a conversation. Um, kids do want your stuff. I oftentimes tell the story about the grandmother in Texas who was in big trouble with her granddaughter because she gave away her china. She said, well, my daughter didn't want it, so I didn't think my granddaughter wanted it. Well, you know what? Her granddaughter was very upset because she did want it. Ask your kids, if your kids don't want it, ask your grandkids. And don't forget about those other, what I always call periphery people. You know, the cousins, the, you know, the, the friends of the family, the neighbors, the folks around you who might say, gee, I'd really like to have something like that. Maybe we could trade something, that kind of thing. So don't be so overzealous to be like, oh, the kids don't want anything. And if you have a problem with what your mom or your grandma are doing with something that you think is a family heirloom, it should be retained in the family, then you need to have a conversation with them. You know, and I can help you with information and guidance about how these things work, but you really need to have a heart to heart with mom or grandma or your kids. Well, those are our questions and our answers for this episode. I'm Dr. Lori. I hope it's helpful. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.